So it feels like it's been a really tough week for our world. And uh, uh, I've heard several people bring up the fact that, you know, it feels like the end times and all this stuff. And Friday night I'm at the football game in Comanche and we go on the field afterwards and I'm talking to Tammy Sanders and she's got this locust. And I'm like, here comes a plague. And then I walked away and was like, okay, I've seen all the, you know, you see all the, the, exoskeletons of the locusts laying around and um, but she was carrying one around and I'm like get that thing away from me I don't want to deal with that and then yesterday morning I'm mowing the yard and I'm in the backyard and then all of a sudden something flies at me and I look down and I think Tammy released that locust on me and I was about to run across the backyard and I'm like God do not send frogs do not send um, everything else that goes with that because it just feels like the world is cratering when you watch the news or you read anything this week, you know, we had a rough week in Afghanistan. And um, my hearts and my prayers are for the families of the, the servicemen that died and not just the servicemen that died, but the countless others that are, have lost their lives or are being tortured by the Taliban. And, and now we have a resurgence of ISIS and... Um, feels like every step the leadership of our, our country takes is the wrong step in so many areas. For the first time in my lifetime, it feels like we're no longer a superpower of a country. We're not the ones making the decisions. We're not dictating the process, but others are. And the world just continues to, to, to fall apart. There's devastating flooding in Tennessee, and, and many lost their lives, and then... Just this morning, if you turned on the news, there's a potentially Category 5 hurricane headed right back into New Orleans 16 years to the day after Katrina. And it just makes you wake up and say, oh, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Oh, Lord Jesus, come quickly. So I want to stop and pray before we dive into anything. I just want to pray right now for that. Because there's nothing wrong in praying Jesus come quickly. Because that's the plan, is that Jesus is coming back. So why not pray for him to come quick, right? So let's pray. Father, we just stop right now and and just pray to you. There's so much hurt in the world right now, Lord. Hurt all across the globe. People are hurting in our country. People are hurting in our community. So we do, and we stop, and we pray, oh, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Come quickly. And if that means that you are going to fulfill your ultimate plan, and Jesus is going to return to take us home, we pray for that. But if that just means that Jesus come quickly is to come and just bring some sort of peace and comfort in our lives now, to just fill us with his presence we pray for that as well. Father, we, we pray as we wrap up this, this look at Habakkuk that you would teach us that no matter how good or how bad times are going, no matter how high we are on the mountain or how low we are in the valley, that you are there, that you have a plan and you have a schedule. And in that, those of us that place our faith in you are secure. So we pray that you would remind us of that this morning. In your name we pray, amen. amen. So I've been asked several times recently, how, how do I decide what we're going to preach? How do I decide what we're going to look at, what I'm going to preach, or, or what I'm going to suggest to the, to the rest of the teaching team, preaching team, the lay pastors to preach on? And uh, honestly, I'm constantly amazed at God's guidance in this area. Earlier this spring, we were laying out the, the, the summer and everything, and I, I really wanted to do a book study, and I was leaning towards doing a book study on Joshua. And then as we uh, had conversations with people in the church and, and, and just getting to me getting to know them more and, and things like that, just really felt like God was saying, no, you don't need to do that. You need to teach about me. 
you need to teach about the characteristics of me because it just felt like a lot of our people were struggling in that area. And, and, and they knew God, but they didn't know God. And so it felt like that. And, and so I uh, really enjoyed teaching the Gaudius series this, this summer. And then, then, but there's always an end, right? And you got to have something next. And, and uh, we, we kind of know where the fall takes us, but there was this little period in between that we needed something and and I said well I wanted to teach a book series through the summer so let's find a book to read or to study and and you know how hard it is to find a book that you can do in three or four weeks in the Bible it's not real easy right and and didn't really know where to go and so about a month and a half ago almost two months ago um, I'd never intended to preach Habakkuk at all I'm going to tell you that um, I can't tell you the last time I read Habakkuk uh, in, in, in my in my daily time. And so this summer, about a month and a half ago, uh, we stole away for a few days. The, the one time this summer that we've been able to get away and we went to Galveston and, uh, um, just to decompress, just to, to shut my mind off. Uh, that's my happy place. That's the, the place that I can go and just, just get away and I can sit and I can sit on the, the balcony of where we stay and, and watch the, the water and listen to the waves crash. And it just brings peace to me. And just calms my soul and calms my spirit. And so one morning before uh, uh, the rest of the family got up, I, I got, got, out of, got out of bed and got my Bible. And I went and I just sat on the patio and I just was like, okay, God, I just need to be refreshed today. And I said, I want to new, read something new. Uh, not, not necessarily new, but something that, that felt new because I hadn't read it in a while, something fresh. And I turned to the book of Habakkuk. And I'm like, hmm, this is interesting. I'm going to read this. I really don't rem- remember a whole lot about what Habakkuk is about at that moment. And so as I started reading it, I read the whole chapter or the whole book that morning, three chapters. So don't think that's like this great glorious thing because if you look at Habakkuk, it's three chapters. We've done it in three weeks and it's not super long. He's a minor prophet for a reason. It fits on one scroll. But I felt like as I read it, I felt like God was saying, you've got to teach this book and you've got to teach this book now. Well, a lot's happened in six, seven weeks since that time. I didn't know what that was for, but I, but I felt like I needed to do that. And, uh, um, and so I started studying on it, and I started reading it, and I started falling in love with the book of Habakkuk and saying, yes, this is a message for us today. Because as much as going on as in the world, things are happening in our lives individually on a daily basis. And we've got to figure out how to navigate those. And we've got to figure out how to navigate those trials and those, those tests and those hard times and, and things that just seem to come out of nowhere. And, and we find ourselves waking up and, and crying out, just like Habakkuk did in, in chapter 1, of where are you, God? He was wondering, where are you, God? And then in chapter 2, as we looked at last week, we find ourselves waiting We're wondering where God is, and then once God speaks to us, we have to wait for his answer to come true. And some of us, that waiting is short, and some of us, that waiting is long. Some of us, that waiting will seem like eternity, and we're just waiting. We live in this tension, but then then as we we move into chapter 3 of Habakkuk, what we find is in that wondering and in that waiting, Habakkuk teaches us how to reconcile that by us praying and us praising. Habakkuk prays and Habakkuk praises. He prays to God and says, yes, I'm going to wait for you. I'm going to wait for you to do your work. I'm going to wait for you to do your will. But I'm also going to praise you in that because I know of who you are. I know your characteristics. I know your attributes. I know you. And so I'm going to praise you for that. So let's look at chapter 3 and see how Habakkuk does this and how we can take it into our lives and and navigate through these hard times. So Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 1 starts out this way. It says, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet according to Shiganoth. Who is Shiganoth? Anybody? Anybody ever met anybody named Shiganoth? Probably not, because it's not a person. Shiganoth is a type of praise. It says it's a passionate, exuberant praise. This is not, I'm going to just sit and speak quietly. 
I'm going to pray quietly. No, it's a prayer of praise, of exuberant praise. It's a, it's a rock till you melt your face off type of praise. There's energy, there's excitement, there is exuberance behind it. It's shiganoth, passionate, exuberant, exuberant praise. And so this whole chapter begins that Habakkuk has just gone through this wondering. He's just gone through this waiting. God has told him, look, you asked me where I am and I am working even though you won't, can't see it. And you're not going to believe what I'm going to do. And Habakkuk says, well, tell me, because try me. I'll believe it. And then God says, okay, I'm going to raise up your enemies, the, the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, to come and crush you. And Habakkuk's like, okay, yeah, I don't believe that. That doesn't work right. That doesn't work for me at this time. I don't want to go through that. But then Habakkuk says, I'm going to wait for you to do that. I know enough about you that I'm going to wait. And so, so now, now he's gone through that and he's heard because then God answers him when he says he's going to wait for your reply of what are you doing? Why are you doing this? And God says, I'm going to do this, but I'm going to do it in this way. And then he talks about the five woes that he's going to place on the Babylonians through that. And that the Babylonians are going to think that what they're doing is their own doing, but it's really God. And I put that into the context of today and think, look at the Taliban, look at the terrorists, look at all the people who want to bring evil in this world. And they think it's their plan and that they're doing it and it's not. God's doing it. God's at work. Why? Because as we looked at in the God is series, God is in control of everything. And God has a plan. And Habakkuk knows that. So he doesn't just say, okay, God, I trust you. He comes with shiganoth. He comes with exuberant praise and says, I am going to praise you. And so in verse 2, chapter 3, verse 2, he says, O Lord, I've heard the report of you and your work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. He says, God, do it. I trust you. Do it. Revive it. Make it known. Bring your name. Bring your wrath. Do what you have to do. But in that, be merciful. Be merciful. He says, God, I know you have a plan. God, I know that that plan might not be exactly what I want to have happen. And it might be painful for, to me. But I have to go through it in order for the plan to be carried out. So God, do it. Do what you have to do. But be merciful in that. I'm reminded when I hear this of Jesus on the cross. Because if Jesus was fully man but fully divine, he had every power possible to take himself off that cross. In fact, don't we hear him mocked for that reason? If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. If you're who you say you are, fix it. But Jesus knew that God had a plan. Jesus knew that God had a plan and he had to go through what he was going through to carry out that plan. And so on the cross, when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's wondering and then he's waiting to die. But then he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Saying, God, be merciful. Habakkuk says, I know it's about to be rough. I know this is about to happen, but be merciful. Do what you have to do, but remember mercy. That's how he starts off this prayer of praise is I'm accepting the fate. I'm accepting what needs to happen. I'm accepting that I cannot control everything. Only you can, God. Just go easy on me. Do what you have to do, but make it a little less bearable. How does Habakkuk get to this point? How can Habakkuk realize 
that God is going to, God is in control and God is going to carry out his plan. And that in that, Habakkuk is going to be okay. Doesn't mean Habakkuk's going to be safe. Doesn't even mean Habakkuk's life is going to be spared. But everything's going to be okay. Well, two things that I think we can see out of this that's going to help us put this into our lives. Because I'm going to be honest with you. This, the first go around, and, and I try not to bring up the word COVID from the stage very often. Because we're done with it, right? Or we want to be done with it, right? And the first go around a year or so ago, it really didn't touch me a whole lot. We had a mild case in our house, but, but I didn't really know very many people that got real sick from it. They didn't end up in the hospital. Uh, only a couple people that I know passed away from it, and they didn't even pass away immediately. It was many, many months later. Really didn't affect me. This go around, I'm about to delete Facebook because of the number of people that I see that I'm connected to that, are, that have people very close to them passing away or people that I am friends with or have known for a long time that are passing away and it makes you think please Lord I don't want that because I don't want to die I've got a family I've got aspirations I've got things I want to do I don't want to have to go through that and then I look at Habakkuk and I realize that Habakkuk would have had those same feelings. You're about to send something to destroy us, to conquer us. I don't want to go through that. I don't want to die. Yeah, you know, I told you a couple of weeks ago that the sermon ended and that was it. Last week we really didn't wrap it up with a neat little bow either. Today doesn't really do that either. When we end this this book, we're not standing in a field of roses. It's still coming. When we leave here today, all is not going to be well in our world. But we change our perspective. And look at what Habakkuk says as we go into verse 3. Habakkuk remembers. He remembers what God has done. Verse 3, it says, God came from Timon and the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covered the earth and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light. Rays flashed from his hand and there he veiled his power. Before him went pestilence and plague followed at his heels. He stood in the measure and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered. The everlasting hills sank low. His, his were the everlasting ways. He remembered who God was. And then as you continue in verse 7 through verse 15, he remembers what God has done. The times that God has punished, the times that God has disciplined, the times that God has brought wrath. Verse 9 says, you strip the sheath from your bow, calling for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. The raging water swept on. The deep gave forth its voice. It lifted its hands on high. The sun and the moon still stood still in their place at the light of your arrows as they sped at the flash of your glittering spear. Habakkuk is remembering God. And in this, you have to realize that Habakkuk is remembering that God rescued Noah. He brought the, the Israelites out of exile in Egypt and out of captivity He used Moses, a broken man, to lead that. And you look all throughout the Old Testament, all throughout the Old Testament stories, you see the times that God has delivered his people and God has rescued his people. And Habakkuk is remembering that through this. He is remembering in his song of praise, God, you have done great things. He knew that God had worked in the past so that he could trust him to work in the present and in the future. And think about in your life, remember in your life the times that God has shown up and the times that God has rescued you. The times that God has delivered you from something that you didn't think could be possible. And for some of you, 
right now might be the first time in your, moment, in your life that you realize that that moment that you were rescued from something wasn't you rescuing yourself, God rescued you. Because this is a thing that I want you to take away. If you look throughout scripture, if you look throughout everything in God's word, you see that God goes to war for his people's salvation. Habakkuk is telling us that God goes to war for his people's salvation, which means God's going to go to war for you. And if that's not a promise to take out of this, I don't know what is. Because you've got God, the creator of the universe, the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end, and he's going to battle and war for you. Habakkuk remembers that. He remembers that. But that doesn't mean he's not afraid. Look at verse 16. It says, I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. He's afraid. He's afraid of what he's about to have to go through. It's okay to feel fear. But this is what the second point is that Habakkuk does here, is not only does he remember, he fearfully embraces what's going to happen with praise. Because he ends verse 16 after he says, my body trembles, my lips quiver at the sound, rottenness enters my bones, my legs tremble beneath me. I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. He says, I will quietly wait. Even though I'm afraid, I'm not going to run around and tell everybody I'm scared. I'm going to wait for God to do his thing. And in that, in that waiting, in that fear, in that scary moment, this is what Habakkuk says in verse 17. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields Yield no food, the flock be cut off from the field, fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Everything you could possibly imagine being devastating there. Terrorist attacks happen in the United States on 9 11's anniversary. We're afraid of that happening. Hurricanes, storms, wildfires, illness, disease, pandemics. Loss of job, loss of income, scary, scary things that cause the fig tree not to blossom, that cause the fruit to not be on the vines, causes the flock to be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. In verse 18, Habakkuk says, yet, key word, yet, all of this bad is happening, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. No matter what happens to me, I know, God, you are in control, so I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. I will take joy in the God of my salvation because in verse 19, God, the Lord is my strength. He makes, me feet, makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on high places. When we remember that God has rescued us, we can fearfully embrace him in praise. The name Habakkuk means to wrestle, which we saw him do in the first two-thirds of this book. But the name Habakkuk also means to embrace, which we see Habakkuk do here. He embraces his fate. He embraces the punishment. He embraces the pain because God is his strength. Which puts into context the verse in the New Testament, the passage in the New Testament, makes us look at it a little bit differently, makes us look at it in a different way, a change of perspective. Philippians 4, verse 11, Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am in to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, of facing plenty 
and of hunger, abundance, and need. Because chapter thir- verse 13, I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. How many of you have, lev- have loved that verse your whole life? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You teach it to your kids. As I was a kid, my parents shared that with me over and over and over again. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. But the perspective changes when you look at verse 11 and 12. When Paul writes to the Philippians, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am in to be content. I've learned whatever's going on in my life to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to be in the valley, how to be where I'm about to be broken beyond repair. And I know how to be in the highest spots. Because our lives go through hills and valleys, right? And God says, and, and Paul, Paul says here that, God, I've known how to do this because you've always been there. Habakkuk says, I know how to do this, God. I know how to go through this. I know how to praise you in the storm because you've always been there. And you've been my strength. Here's what Habakkuk tells us, how to get through this in life. When you see that God is coming and and it's not going to be fun and storms are on the the horizon and and the life is about to get really tough and life's about to get really painful and it's going to be really hard. Habakkuk says, don't walk away. Don't walk away. When when he's wondering in chapter one, he could have just walked away. He said, God, where are you? Okay, you're not here, I'm out. But no, Habakkuk had a love for his city, a love for the people that he lived with and around, and a love for God. And he says, don't walk away. And then don't quit. When God says, I'm about to bring the Babylonians, how easy would it have been to say, for Habakkuk to say, I'm out, we're done, I quit. I don't want to be who I am anymore. It's all over. But he doesn't. He says he's going to wait. And then as God continues to lay out the plan to Habakkuk and shows Habakkuk what's going to happen, Habakkuk could have easily walked away and quit even more because his circumstances aren't changing. But what he allows to happen is he allows God to change his perspective. And you go, as you go through these circumstances in your life, even if they don't change, even if they don't get better, if they only feel like they're getting worse, worse, allow God to change your perspective. We sang a song this morning that says, I'm no longer a slave to fear, but I'm a child of God. Habakkuk says in verse 16 of chapter 3, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. But in verse 18, I'm not a slave to it. Because I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. The song also says that God parted the sea so we could walk right through it. How do we know? Because God parted the sea in Scripture so his people could walk right through it. Here's the thing. Habakkuk in chapter three is having a very intimate moment with God. Have you ever worshiped? Have you ever really, really worshiped? There's an intimacy in that, right? There's a moment that there's nobody else around. It's just you and God. There's an intimacy. In order for Habakkuk to get to chapter three, he had to go through chapter one and two. In order for Habakkuk to have that intimacy with God, he had to have the wonder and he had to have the waiting. In order for you 
to have that intimacy with God. You have to have the wonder and you have to have the waiting. You have to go through those moments because when you're up here on the high spots, it's easy to do life. But when you're in the valley, it gets very tough. And that's when you wonder and you wait and that's when you grow in Christ because you learn that he will rescue you. You learn that he will save you. You learn that he will go to war for you. And so as we wrap up, I just want to leave this with this. God is in control. And if you allow him, God will change your perspective on life so that you can endure and you can embrace. Some of you might be at that point that you've been wondering and waiting and never realized what you were wondering and waiting on. And today you realize that your waiting is to have that intimacy with God because you believe that Jesus on the cross said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And then he died and took our sin with him in death so that when he rose again and defeated that death, we could have eternal life in him. And that we could boldly and bravely say, Romans 10, 9, that I believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord. And I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and God sent his son to die for me. Oh,